The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. I thought this year I would talk about uh, colors in languages, and I've called the talk a polyglot's prism, uh, or the Spaß mit Farben. Ich habe es vor Englisch zu sprechen, aber wenn Sie Fragen auf andere Sprachen stellen möchten, bitte tun Sie das, wenn ich die, die uh, Sprachen verstehe, versuche ich auch zu antworten. Um, but basically, you're in English. So, it's not too serious a talk. Um, it's in three parts. Um, as uh, in Wales, one of my languages, they always say, tri fen i brege da. Um, three points to a good sermon. And first of all, I just want to look a bit about uh, what colour actually is. So, we won't go too far into the physics. I realised quite early on in the preparation of this that that wasn't a particularly good idea for me. I think that uh, polyglots, we divide maybe roughly into two groups. Those of us who are in languages because we can't basically do numbers. <laughs> and uh, uh, those of us who are geeks several times over because we're mathematics experts, computer experts, and so on and so forth. I, uh, unfortunately, am in the first category. So I won't be giving you any equations of light or anything like that. But why should we bother about colors? Well. I think they're among the most useful and the high frequency words that you come across. You know, we know from our own childhood how uh, you know, we appraise when we remember colours, we try and teach our own children perhaps colours. Um, and they have a rich use in the language, not only frequent for descriptive purposes, but also in a literal sense. And there's a whole lot of culturally charged symbolism around, uh, around them too. Um, I had a whole section which I had to jettison because there wouldn't be time on cross-cultural communication and the symbols of colours, white meaning marriage or death or wherever you are. You know, there are variations. That's all interesting stuff we can't go into, but it's all there in the background. And there are also then big linguistic debates in the field. That's the second chunk of the talk today. So I'm going to try and probe a little bit as an enthusiastic layman uh, a little bit into those debates before I get to the final section which is some practical examples. And this is where I hope that you'll be able to chip in and share your experience as well. Um, you find much when you start to look at colors, when you start learning your first foreign language, many of us have done this many times, you start to realize um, all sorts of strange things happening. First of all, you discover apparently new colors which you didn't know existed, or at least new names for chunks on the spectrum. Um, uh, you discover sometimes that uh, there are expressions where colour is not used as a descriptor at all. Uh, the colour seems to have vanished from the picture. And you find objects changing colour quite literally. I was rather startled when I started learning Welsh to find that the grass is described as blue. Uh, and that's not just to do with the fertiliser they use in the valleys in South Wales. <laughs> Uh, so um, there's quite a lot of fun stuff to look at, which will alert us in general, I think, to the differences between languages and uh, the care that we need to take as we advance through our language learning um, and want to um, be as accurate as possible and as idiomatic as possible in our expressions. Richard of York gave battle in vain. Don't worry, this is not an early rendition for the culture evening. Um, any non-native, uh, non-English native speakers know what, what on earth this is about? Yes, sir. So probably he lost the battle? Uh, right, that's a very literal take, which, uh, but it's actually not correct this time, but uh, it's a true historically, of course, yes, depending on who we're talking about. Yes? It looks like a, a way of remembering colours of the very good, excellent. Uh, I don't know from your accent, but you speak very good English if it's not your native language, but uh, there we go. Um, Richard of York gave battle in vain. And there's a clue for you. Um, that is a famous, well, there's a debate of which Richard of York, the Duke or King, lost a battle. That's what we're taught at school, to remember the colours of the rainbow. R red, orange, yellow, green, blue, Indigo, violet. Indigo is this sort of deep blue purpley. It's a color which is really only used when you're describing the rainbow, unless you're a graphic designer, um, <laughs> which is rather confusing. But uh, those are the colors then. So meet the colors. There you are. And I've translated rainbow into those languages which I've dabbled in uh, during my time so far. Um, so you might see one that you know there as well. I'm sure you will. So that's a rainbow. 
And this I found on the internet, and I've had uh, Irina confirm to me that this is, uh, this is um, a, uh, a genuine Russian way of doing the same thing. Each hunter wishes to know where the pheasant sits. Krasny, aranjivie, zholtie, zhilionie, galuboy, sinie, fioletovi. And maybe there are in your language, uh, uh, if it's, you know, have you come across these rhymes in your own languages? Anybody? Put your hand up, don't worry, I won't ask you to. On the spot. Yeah, somebody has there. Yes, which language? Well, actually, it's in American English. It's uh, yes. Roy that's right, yes, that's another one, yes, quite right, yeah. We are taught VibGR. Uh, okay. VibGR, that's how we remember the colors of the rainbow. Okay, okay. Any others? A song, okay, good. Well, maybe later we can, we can uh, uh, share that as well. So what is color? Well, color, this is where it gets all physics here. I'll go past through this pretty quickly. It's, uh, you know, it's a quality of light. Um, it's electromagnetic radiation, it turns out, that which is visible to the human eye. So at the one end of the spectrum, you've got the infrared, and then you've got the ultraviolet at the other end that we can't see beyond the rainbow, as it were. Um, and objects appear coloured because of the way that they interact with light. Uh, and it's not just the physics of the, the object and the way the light interacts with it, but it's also our own human vision, obviously. Different, different uh, uh, you know, your dog sees things differently from you do, they can see better in the dark and so on. And individual interpretation is also important um, in, uh, in colour perception. Um, another whole issue someone mentioned me to was gender, whether there was any difference uh, in gender perception, which is not something I deal with, but again, it's something we might like to talk to. So I'm not sure if, uh, if she meant it was because, uh, I think she thought women were better, but whether that's because they're choosing different, you know, different clothes in the shop all the time, I don't know. Or is it blokes, men, because they're distinguishing between all the football colours? I don't know. Um, but uh, we won't go too far with those stereotypes, but there might be a gendered aspect too, that's not something I deal with. Um, but certainly personal interpretation could come into it. Hue is uh, what we call, they're actually individual colours of the rainbow, the individual wavelengths. Um, I think it's um, Farbton or something like that in German. So um, that's the, the pure colour, if you like, or mixture of pure colours along the rainbow. Um, and all colour, all colours can be described as a mixture of three properties. There's the hue first, so the position along the rainbow, there's saturation, which is basically narcissionist in Russian, how light or pale or deep or how dark the colour actually is. Um, and uh, then there's also intensity, which I gather is to do with the energy in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, um, the colour, in the, in the radiation. So it's brightness or dullness. So it's the hue, the colour of the rainbow, plus saturation, how light or dark, how much black or white is put in from a, from a printing point of view, and the intensity, how bright or dull it is. There are further technical terms. Gloss, which is how shiny an object is. Iridescence, which is angle dependent, this idea of reacting to the surface. So when you look at bubbles in the, in the bath, or um, a, a, a pearl, it seems to reflect off different colors. That's iridescence. There's something similar that's called dichroism. There's opacity, how much light is let through. So it's not just the colors of the rainbow, but it's the saturation, the lightness and the darkness, the intensity, and the nature of the surface itself. Why does all that matter? Good question. Um, well, it alerts you to the multifaceted reality um, that you're describing when you're talking about color. And this becomes important when you start to look how different cultures have used or haven't used color terms uh, throughout the globe at different times. It's directly relevant to the linguistic debate about colour uh, and the debate and part of a wider debate between universalism and relativism. So, the basic study, and many of you who are professional linguists will know much more than me about this, on colour terms. Uh, one of the landmark studies in this field was by um, two scholars called Berlin and Kay, and they published a paper uh, in 1969, um, I think 1968, basic colour terms, their universality and evolution. And this was essentially arguing that across cultures, um, the way colour is, is perceived is essentially the same, but that over time, cultures develop 
um, uh, or human groups develop their um, uh, color terms along a set scale. And that they found that they argued that all cultures had a difference between white and black, and then comes red, and then over time you get a term for green and or yellow developing, then blue, then comes brown, then in, or in any order, purple, pink, orange, or gray. But the idea is that anywhere you are on this scale, if you've got a word for blue in your language, you will also have all these other colors. If you've got a word for brown, you will also have blue, green, yellow, red, white, and pink. So this was their idea, and this, this picked up an old debate which had been going since the middle of the 19th century and, and gave it new life um, in the final third of the 20th century. Um, the theory is that all languages then with six color terms distinguish these six colors. Um, so that would be the first six on the scale. So white, black, red, green, yellow, and blue. And those correspond roughly with the sensitivities of the eye. Uh, and so they argued that there are actually physiological, biological processes at the basis, as the basis of color perception. It wasn't just all about random divisions set by, by the culture. And there's much to like, I think, in this model. It seems realistic, and I think the evidence supports the idea that physiology does set limits to where color boundaries are drawn on a spectrum. The order of appearance of terms does seem to have a lot to, uh, to credit it. it. There does seem to be something special about red, which tends to be the third, you know, so light and dark, white, uh, white and black to start with, but red is the color of blood. It's quite a common color in nature. In nature, though, um, you don't have to distinguish between green and blue very often. Blue is not a particularly common color um, in, uh, in the world around you. You might think of the sea, you might think of the sky, but um, again, we'll come back to those in a minute, but green and green is around much more. So, so there's sort of a logic to that, but it hasn't gone without criticism. Um, because people have said this elevates the idea that hue, rather than saturation, intensity, lightness and darkness, is the key thing in distinguishing color. So the theory elevates the focal hue model of color. Um, it assumes that there's a semantic domain, which we're talking about, which is all about hue, which is all about color. Um, but others have noticed, and noticed for a long time, that in some cultures, the place along the rainbow wasn't the most important thing when they were describing things. Uh, people would refer much more in ancient Greece, for example, it was noticed in the 19th century, to the brightness and the darkness. That seemed to be much more important. The wine dark sea in the Homer, that sort of idea. So it was the darkness that was more important. And another criticism of the basic color terms approach is that it ignores the grammatical distribution of how a term can be used and its referential range, what a term is actually used for. And these are important aspects that anthropologists, or linguistic anthropologists in the field have found to be very important. Um, one of the most famous critiques, and I'll only mention this one really, is the one by Daniel Everett. Some of you may know his, his books, Language and Cultural Tool. He talks about that in here. And he uh, studied this Piraha tribe in Brazil on the, on the Amazon. Um, and he argues, although there's a lot of debate around this among the specialists, but we leave that to one side for a moment, that there are no real color terms among these people. It's only a small group, maybe three or 400 people. The key thing for, the, for them is whether things are light and dark. Um, and somebody else had studied this language earlier on, and when he was beginning to study it, he was translating from a, you know, an Anglo-Saxon perspective. Um, the word, one word here, called bi, I don't know how it's pronounced, uh, as white, but the longer he lived among these people, he realized that they were actually using it to mean something more like clear or transparent. Uh, the same thing with this next word, kopaii, which he thought was black initially. Uh, it can describe a panther or a dark animal. But with darker-skinned people, other tribes round about, they would say their blood is opaque. They wouldn't say they're black or they're dark. So they would describe in a different way. He gives the example of the dark night, which literally is that the jungle is the color of uh, you know what. So um, they weren't actually ascribing the color, they were comparing. And the word he thought initially was red, turned out that it was more, it's like blood. And the word he thought was a blue and green, was more actually being used for unripe, young. It was applied to things which were blue, things which were green in a descriptive way, but also for unripe fruit, fruit, fruit for young children as well. 
So um, that's an example where it wasn't just a matter of you know, getting words uh, um, to describe color, but looking at other qualities of the light. And there are other examples like that too. Um, there's a study of the, the Yele language done by Yavin, Yav, Levinson, which I won't go into, but um, um, both of these languages turn out to be covered well on the, on the Omniglot site, it turns out, which is no surprise I found when I, was, when I was looking into this, so you can discover more there for yourselves. Um, but it's true that some languages have fewer basic color terms, so or if we take a sort of critical view, they're not just focusing on the hue. So in ancient Greek, I gather, um, there was the word kyanios, which meant dark blue, but it could also be used for dark green, violet, brown things, while the word glaukos for light blue could also mean light green, grey or yellow. So again, maybe it was the, the saturation, the brightness which was being emphasised rather than the hue. In Latin, there's no basic word for brown or grey, I gather. In medieval Welsh, the word glass was used to cover green, blue, and various shades of grey, and it's a survival of that, which means that the um, word glasswert in Welsh means a lawn, uh, grass in, you know, in, in, a, in a park uh, today. And we have words in modern Welsh today, such as glasslank, which means a young novice, a young boy, glasswert, and I gather there's a similar word, gorm, in uh, modern Gaelic, with a, with a similar use, so that's maybe a Celtic feature. But you could say glass in Welsh, medieval Welsh, of a sword, or the colour of a stone, or to describe the sea. So maybe again, it was, it was uh, expressing a lightness, the darkness, and the shininess of the surface, uh, or the smoothness of the surface, as much as the actual hue. So there's a whole group of languages then, which have fewer basic colour terms than the 11, which Berlin and Kay said were in it, found in English, for example. They argued one or two had 12, like Russian, but, um, uh, basically, uh, there are fewer, sometimes basic, colour terms when you, when you start to, to learn other languages. Um, and historically, uh, so I've got other examples. Chinese, I gather, had this quing, excuse the lack of tone, which covered blue and green for much of its history, and can still, I gather, be used for a wider range. You can perhaps chip in on this later on um, uh, in, in modern Chinese, although there are words now for blue and green, and there's something similar in Japan with this word, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, A-O, can anybody do that? Oh. Ow, it's as simple as that, somebody stood on your toe, depending on the situation, can mean blue or green, but there is a more modern word, so, Midori, thank you, um, which I gather is a relatively recent bother borrowing, which also means, which means green now, but the old term used to perhaps cover both, or part of both. Um, and I've got a, a whole load of different examples down here, um, the Latin, Latin had two words for black, ater, it's a flat, dull black, and niger, which was a, a brilliant, saturated black. And the same was in English. The in Middle English had the word swart, which survives in suave, which you say sometimes a sort of, a, a sort of deeper skin, um, a rougher skin, a peasant who's been working in the fields or something. Uh, and it also had the word black, which is obviously the, the uh, antecedent of the modern black. And we, they had in Old English the word brun, which meant any dark or dusky color which has come into brown, uh, become brown. Uh, in Welsh, they used often the word yellow for brown, uh, or grey, depending on... Uh, and even in modern literary Welsh, they use uh, melin to describe brown shoes, skidia melin, not in conversational Welsh, but that survived quite long. And you do see in written Welsh occasionally, uh, papier llid, for what, which literally means grey paper, for brown paper. So historically, there have been fewer colors, or hue has not been the main focal point. Um, and we see cultures converging, perhaps, with westernization, as in Japan or the Welsh example. Um, so the driver may be uh, new descriptive models are needed because um, there are more things to describe. Technological developments, new dyes are invented. There are more vivid colors around people, so they need new words. So they are coined, or they are borrowed. And simple cultural borrowings, uh, the word for, for gwerth, for green in modern Welsh, is borrowed from the Latin, for example. Um, so that's one side of the picture, fewer colour terms. But on the other side, sometimes you find that there are more basic colour terms in the language, and this uh, in the language that you're learning. And uh, the classic example of this um, would be 
uh, in Russian, where there are famously uh, two words for blue. So some languages have several basic color terms um, uh, uh, covered by one basic term in another language. Perhaps I should just scroll back and explain a bit what Berlin and K meant by basic color terms. They meant a word which is one word, so pink, not light red. And this was a word which um, was widely accepted and, and used to describe um, a part of the spectrum among the society. But it was, it was one word that couldn't be reduced to a shade, if you like, of a, of a different color. So uh, we have dark blue and light blue in English, but they're not basic color terms. The basic color is blue. Um, so some languages have several basic color terms for a range of colors covered by one basic term in our other languages. And obviously I'm looking at this from an, an English native perspective, uh, although some of my examples go across languages later on. Um, the narrow terms may be selected by hue, or by how light and dark, or by the intensity. So one that's become uh, emerged in English by hue is the color orange, which is on the rainbow. But if you go back a thousand years, it might have been described more as red yellow or brown yellow, depending until the fruit orange appeared on the scene. Um, and uh, the, the word uh, is now used. Um, we have words for, <coughs> we have a word in English for brown, which is uh, um, a low intensity orange yellow hue. Uh, but not all languages have that. Uh, so English is an example which has more words for color than uh, traditional Welsh, for example, where you use kochthi, something like that, which means literally a black red, blacky red. And other languages, German does this, I think, sometimes too. So we have a brown, but the same equivalent for a, um, a low intensity yellow green light, which is what we call olive green. Uh, it stands in the same relationship to green as, as brown does to orange and yellow. We don't have a word for that. We just say olive green, so it's not a basic color term. We do split pink and red. They're regarded as generally as separate colors. Pink is not regarded as a shade of red in general. And it's the same, the similar idea in Russian. But then things start getting different, as I found when I started trying to learn Russian, um, that they have these two words, the pale blue, galuboy, for the sky, for example, it's the fifth color of the rainbow. And they've got another one, sinyi, for a dark blue, a dark blue. And it turns out that this is, um, uh, found in other languages too. In uh, Hebrew, also I read, they have a word for light blue and uh, for dark blue. Although I did read a suggestion that this was introduced to modern Hebrew by the revivers, who many of whom came from a Russian, Russian-influenced background. Who can help me with the situation in Italian? Because um, uh, some have suggested this azzurro, and then you've got blue as dark blue. Um, is that used in who speaks Italian? Who's Italian? So is, is uh, Azura a, a subcategory of blue, or are they separate? It's blue marine, actually. <laughs> yes, in English, but are they, are they regarded as separate colors in Italian, or is one as... Are, they are Azura is lighter. Azura uh, yeah. is perceived lighter. Yeah, but it can't, they can't both be both at once. No, no. no, no. Like something in English can be blue and light blue at once, yeah? But it can't be one or the other. But they're separate terms. That's interesting. Okay, we'll talk about that later. But um, there's something similar in Turkish. Any Turkish speakers, is that right? Mavi and Lasivert. Yes, Lajivert. Lajivert, yeah. yeah. Um, we have words in English for light blues, um, but uh, they're not separate colors. They are subdivisions of blue. Um, what about Hungarian? Any Hungarian natives? I've met some. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Andrea, you're there. So there's this word, pirosh and dvorosh. And um, um, Again, there seems to be some debate even among his Hungarians and a lot of research as to whether these are both basic color terms. Um, and um, Berlin and Kay thought that they were in their study, but they only had apparently a, a very small sample of Hungarians. And there's, there's academic research on this. I was reading a paper on the way over on the plane. But in general, we won't go into the details, but the usage is slightly different. Whether they are, one is lighter and one is darker, uh, Piros tends to be lighter. Uh, and uh, verish tends to be darker, but also they're used in different circumstances. So it's again not just hue here. Um, uh, apparently, the pirosh is used more for joyful, inanimate, uh, natural things. And verish is the darker red, which is animate, serious, emotionally involved, which comes from the color 
the, the word for blood, I think, eti etymologically. Yes, yes. And for example, there are some nouns that I would not say piros for, and there are some nouns that I would not say for. Yes, yes. For example, rose is one of them. We don't say piros rose, but we say verus rose. Okay. Or wine. Wine. wine is also Verish. So wine is verish and rose is verish. Yes. Right, remember that for your Hungarian. <laughs> Two for the price of one here. So that's a, a quick survey. So remember, there is this idea that there are basic colour terms. There's also an idea that actually, and they're based on hue, so the wavelength basically along the, the rainbow. There's also the possibility that uh, in the past in different cultures, um, uh, the key thing wasn't hue, it was brightness or darkness, shininess, intensity, which was the key descriptor, so that things, um, they would use what we think the word for black, but actually is more akin to dark and, and dull or dark and shiny to describe things that, where we might describe them as blue, green, gray, or, or yellow, uh, light green, depending. So um, there's a lot of variety there, there's a lot of richness there. We move now, flip over to the second part of the talk, which is really about a more practical uh, examples um, of how you use the new color word. So when you're learning a new language, you want to get a sense of the basic color terms, you will be excited, you suddenly realize the two words for blue, or there are two words for, um, for red, or you are, you're a Russian native speaker and you suddenly realize that um, uh, you know, English is a terribly impoverished language because they're so barbaric, they don't even distinguish between senior and gallo boy. Um, so you have to uh, unrefine yourself um, appropriately also to fit in. So I've got some examples now, uh, literal descriptions of figurative usage, and um, uh, let's, let's go through those. Before we do that, I just wanted to flag one thing up. I'd like you to share your ideas afterwards. So I put this sheet together. So if it occurs to you, I either we can bring it up in the discussion at the end, or afterwards I'll stick this up on the door by the, the foyer room and the registration room, try and post it up on the door. And you can write down any examples during the course of the rest of the gathering of uh, interesting color usages you've come across in your own language or in uh, a language you're learning, interesting color idioms or rhymes to remember the order of the rainbow or whatever it is, and then I'll, uh, I'll put them together and uh, um, report back on my, on my blog uh, when I get home. So uh, that will be going up uh, later on. So the obvious thing to say is we don't want to get too hung up on this, that um, a, a um, literal translation often works. So uh, don't get too scared. In French, a green apple is le pomme vert, yeah. Shout out if you find any mistakes in what I'm saying, because many of these, my French is sort of medium level, my German and Russian are a bit better, but I've been using my own knowledge and dictionaries, so um, this does not claim to be infallible, so either put me on the spot within reason so we can get to the end of the talk, or we can at the end discuss, or you can, you can set me right on the, on the board, at the, on the, the sheet at the end. Brown shoes in French, chasseurs, Marron. Marron is the basic color for brown in, in French. Hello. Hello. Actually, pomme is feminine. Pomme. La pomme verte. Yes, that's very good. Well, my grammar's correct, but my gender's wrong. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I won't forget that now. Um, so, chasseurs marron, um, the blue sea, das blaue Meer in German. So, it works. It seems to work. Right, white bread. We're getting perhaps a bit more figurative here. In Russian, it's Bieli Chleb, it's the same, the same in Welsh, Baragrin, Baraguin. So there's no problem very often when you're using colors to describe, a literal translation is going to do the trick for you. As long as you remember if you're learning Hungarian or Russian, that you might have some extra basic color terms in play and you're going to have to remember um, which one do you use for the sky and which do you use for the sea in Russian or how do you describe a, a rose. So, so far, so good um, with literal translations, but it doesn't always, unfortunately, work quite that easy. So red wine is something I just discovered um, when I started learning Basque, it's the language I'm learning at the moment, and you don't actually say red wine in Basque, you say Ardo Belza, which means literally black wine, black wine. Uh, and um, I think it was Irina, I don't know if she's here, had said yeah. there was a... Yeah. 
in Serbian as well, the same, the same is true in Serbian as well. So, so that's an interesting one. Uh, red meat in Russian, chornaya miasa. Red meat in English, it means meat from uh, a cow or a pig rather than meat from, say, a chicken, or which the Russians don't even regard as meat at all necessarily. Um, uh, or uh, and, uh, red meat would be from a sheep as well. Um, we say brown ale, for example. The French have bière brune. It's a different word, not marron. There's a debate around that as well. Kurukoch in Welsh is literally red beer. Red beer, not brown beer. Um, bread. Barakoch in Welsh traditionally was what you'd call brown bread. I think most modern speakers would use barabrun, which is the loan word, but barakoch. Um, and in, in, in uh, Russian, you say siri or chorni chleb, black bread, which you, you can't really say in English. Okay, partly it's because it's, it's a rye bread, different ingredients. You don't really say it in English. Brown sugar, we say in English. It's a type of sugar. It's a yellowy color. And you put it in a coffee, for example. In Welsh, it's sugar, sugar koch. Um, and, and in other languages, I think they use different words. Uh, here's a good one. Schwarzer Tee auf Deutsch, black tea. And this is an example that Judith gave me. In Chinese, it's not called black tea. Uh, and we wouldn't really say that in English either. You'd say tea without milk, perhaps, I don't know, or just normal tea. You'd say a copper, and uh, you wouldn't even know. Um, but they say a hong cha, sorry about the tones again, red tea. You s in yeah. German, uh, yes. Tea. Good. Yeah. Uh, Schwarze tea, yes. Yeah. Schwarze tea. There is no article, but yeah. when there is one, you drop the R, and also without tea. Without tea. The Schwarze tea. The Schwarze tea. One word, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Yes, yeah, a type of tea, yes. Yeah, I, I, I corrected myself there. I said we, talk, we just talk about uh, normal tea or, or household tea. Um, and, and then you say your hair is going grey in English, um, unless you have any chemical assistance. Um, but, uh, and in French they have grisonné, which is also... Uh, related the same way. Um, but in Welsh, you say the gwall and glassy traditionally. Your hair is going blue, the sort of the blue rinse. Um, and in Basque, you actually use the verb, the, you use the color green. The hair is going green. Don't ask me how that's the case. Um, sometimes, so it's not just a different color, but maybe it's a more precise color. So Aside from the basic color terms, within the spectrum, within the basic color terms, languages also, of course, have um, many specialist words which you can focus on to enrich your vocabulary. Um, and English uh, red, for example, we have words like scarlet uh, or vermilion for the brighter orangey reds. And then we have crimson, another word. Uh, for a bluish red, and they're often cognate words in the other European languages, often quite similar. There are some examples that I found. So you might subdivide by hue within the basic color term. So you can be both of these things at once. Something that's red is also can be crimson. It's a crimson red, um, uh, but it can't be blue in English. And then you have domain limited usages as well. And here, this French uh, marron is a good example. That uh, they've also got brun, brun, marron, I think it stays the same, is that right? It doesn't, yeah. yes, it stays fixed. Um, which a brun is used mainly, I gather, for hair, eyes, or skin. Um, and then they have this word chatain as well, which is a chestnut brown, which is used mainly for hair. So be alert to these uh, uh, refined ways that you can use color. So, uh, so back to examples of those then. Uh, red hair in English, where we have a basic color term in English and something a bit more, a bit more sophisticated in another language. So red hair, rigi volasi in Russian. And they've got this word rus, I don't know how you pronounce that in French. Rou? Rou, yeah. So, which you might use in French. In, in, for brown hair, I gather you use chevaux châtain and not marron. Is that right, French speakers? Châtain, okay, yeah. Châtain with no E. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, brown eyes, les yeux bruns, yeah? Um, brown bread, pain b is what I found, yeah? So that is more of a gray bread, so it's not black like in Russia and France, it's gray. 
Um, uh, brown eyes in Russian is karya glaza, yeah? So not karichivi, which is the basic maybe word for brown. Um, here the French is the simple one and the English is the, the, the flashy one. So they say uh, for the traffic lights, it's a uh, four jeune or lumière. And we say, at least in Britain, uh, an amber traffic light. That's the name that we use for the color. I think you might say yellow in the United States. Um, but that's the color, r red, amber, green in English. We don't think of it as yellow. Nobody would say yellow for the middle light on a traffic light. Um, and then back to the Basque, they do have red wine. That's for them a simple color term. The only thing is in English or in Russian, uh, we call it rosé. We've got a more sophisticated word for that. Rosavoy um, vino. So um, that's another example. And then there are examples where color is not used at all. You're maybe in your head trying to translate. You're thinking that color is the key descriptive thing, but it's not actually used in your target language. Some of these are compounds. So we have blue bottle, which is a type of fly. In German, according to my dictionary, it's a Schmeißflieger. Uh, and we've got la mouche à viande in French. Nothing to do with color. So if you translate literally into your target language, it's one of those two people might look at you uh, rather confused. Another one I liked in, in uh, German was the Blaufox. Uh, it's not a blue fox, German speakers. No one's going to understand you. We call that an Arctic fox. Also, another one I didn't know found, Grünrock in German which uh, is a gamekeeper, uh, uh, means literally a green clothes, a yeah, green dress, or a huntsman. Um, ah, this is a good one as well. In French, le tabac gris, grey tobacco. But if you say that in English, then people won't understand what you mean. Um, we, for that, that's, it, that's, as that's cheap tobacco, or the wonderful word shag, which uh, has a different meaning as well. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Brown paper, it's a good one too. If you ask, say, I want some brown paper in English, you're not really talking about the color usually, unless you're in a stationery shop. It means wrapping paper to send something through the post. Um, and abjortochnaya bumaga, maybe in Russia, papier d'emballage. It seems that in those languages, the color is not the key descriptive factor. So nothing to do with color here. Now let's move to the figurative side. So there are some pretty literal examples where you're actually just trying to describe an object that you want or describe its color. But sometimes you're using color as well, as, as, you know, as I said, in, in a, a uh, figurative sense, in uh, uh, some sort of idiomatic expression, perhaps. So we say to see red, uh, and you can say rot sehen, I think, in German, yeah? So that's the, is it a capital R? Should it be, is it a, a, a noun? Rot, okay. So uh, there it would work. If you do a literal translation as a fumbling English speaker trying to speak German, would work. Red rag to a bull is a provocation. The idea of a red rag, a piece of red material, makes the bull come towards you. It's not literal, it's figurative. And this seems to exist in uh, several lang other languages, quite a common idea. We have to give somebody the green light, donner le feu vert à quelqu'un en français, oui? So it will be the same, maybe not everywhere, maybe not in Japan, I don't know. Uh, a blue stocking is a bookish woman, de, uh, de Blaustrumpf, yeah, uh, is also in German. Um, and uh, many, many other examples where it's the same, to blacklist somebody, auf die schwarze Liste setzen, to mark somebody out as an awkward customer, to refuse to deal with them, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Figurative again, maybe though it's not the same color. Maybe it's a different color. So uh, we talk about a blue movie in English, which means a pornographic movie, a sex movie. Uh, in uh, Welsh you say film goch, a red film, literally. And Chinese, I came across yellow movie. Chinese speakers, have you? Yeah, you say that, yeah. Um, a black leg is somebody who's a strike breaker. If a factory or a coal mine is on strike, one of the workers continues to work, makes themselves very unpopular with the other colleagues. Uh, that's called a black leg. And the French equivalent I found for this was un jaune, yellow, which again wouldn't work in English. You can say green with envy. In German, you can also say that, but they also say gelb 
for night, yeah? You don't say yellow with envy in English, for example. So English and German change, different, change color. Um, black eye, maybe that should have been in the earlier section, but ein blaues Auge auf Deutsch. Auf Deutsch sagt man blau sein, to be drunk. In French, I came across être gris, which means to be slightly, we say tipsy in English, a little bit drunk, yeah? So, as you know, if you say I'm feeling blue in English, native speakers, no learners may know, it means that you're depressed, you're, you're down. Doesn't mean anything to do with alcohol at all. <laughs> I've got some more examples. So, red tape. Valakita uh, uh, in Russian. It comes across it a lot in Russia when you're trying to register yourself at the, at the police. The uh, rote Faden is a, a red thread. Uh, in Russian, they say that too. It's a common theme, a recurring element. If you try and literally translate that, Russians, Germans, into English, I don't know about other languages, uh, people aren't going to understand what you mean. The same with the Russian Zolti uh, Dom, which in literary Russian, I gather, is used for what we call a madhouse or a lunatic asylum, a, a hospital for people with, with mental problems. A joke koch in Welsh, you would, um, that's also figurative, uh, but in English you wouldn't say a red joke. We, you sometimes do say a blue joke, but more likely, at least in British English, you'd say it's a dirty joke. It's a dirty joke. Um, and uh, yeah, so rire jaune in French is to give a sickly smile or a forced laugh. Uh, une histoire jeune, a tall tale, is an exaggerated or untrue story, but not a yellow story, at least in English it doesn't work. We say browned off, yeah? It means uh, être découragé in French, yeah? It, uh, so, colour's not used at all. It means I'm fed up, I've had enough. Who asked that? Was that you, Ursula? So it's not used in America. There you go, yes. That's another t there's another talk for us. I picked up on the, the yellow and the, the amber traffic lights, but uh, some differences maybe I, I missed. Um, and the final slide on this then, uh, some more I found, a wonderful one I didn't know in German, der Blaumann, so I sort of googled it with Google Images and it seemed to be correct. Uh, it's not a, I'm a blue man, it's what we call overalls in English, or a blue, uh, uh, so it's, it's a blue suit, but we call it a boiler suit. So if you, you're German, you go into a shop in England and say, I'd like to buy a Blaumann, please. Yeah, a uh, blue man, please. Uh, uh, well, I don't know what's going to happen, but you are not going to get a boiler suit. Um, einer Fahrt ins Blau, a trip to nowhere in particular. Blau machen, yeah, to sky, skip or skive off work, not to go to work, pretend that you're ill. Um, der graue Alltag is not the grey every day in English, nobody says that. Um, it's a dull or drab reality, daily grind. Faire gris mean, uh, be none too pleased with somebody, to, be, to give somebody the cold shoulder in English. So they're also quite idiomatic expressions in English um, and extremely idiomatic to do with color in French. So just remember, color is a, a vast and uh, fascinating subject. Uh, it's interesting to compare across cultures um, and to be aware that literal translation does not always work. Um, sometimes it does but also that there are ways that you can enrich and refine your vocabulary. And to be very careful, this was mentioned in the translation session this morning, some of you were here, with idioms, that you want to translate one idiom, not literally, but with an equivalent idiom, uh, if there is one, in the language. So the final slide, what's at the end of the rainbow? Well, all those who've been brought up with uh, English as their mother tongue know very well that it's... Um, uh, what we call a crock of gold. And that's one of those very interesting words. It comes from crocker, which is Old English, which is a sort of pot. Um, and it's only used in this context in English. Um, and there's the gold at the end. Or maybe we would, sh we, knowing what we do now about the physics of color, maybe we should say that it's not the golden color at all, but it's a yellow-orange gloss. <laughs> um, and then a whole new area, which I didn't have time to cover, um, but that's proverbs and sayings using colors. So, just to bring things down at the end, a bit more Protestant North European pessimism and a bit of a warning at the end, uh, we have a phrase in English, all that glistens, that means sparkles, that is shiny, is not gold. And either more literally in a colour sense, in Welsh, nid air 
popeth melin. Everything that's uh, uh, need melin popeth air. Need air popeth melin. Yes. Not everything that looks gold is actually that looks yellow is gold. There we are. Thanks very much. We've maybe got a couple of minutes, but not much more. If you want to share any examples, um, please do so. Please use the mic. Have we got another mic? Thanks. A couple things come to mind. There's definitely differences between the sexes, between perception of color. So that's something to definitely read about. There's lots of studies about that. So one of the questions that I think of when I think of that is, how was the research done over time? And from an historical perspective, how does that influence or not influence the data? Um, and then the second bit is about uh, coming from the north. If you see dark ice, um, it's not necessarily black or white that people think about, but it's the gradation of darkness, and darkness typically means unsafety, so you're going to go through it. And so that's the more important aspect of, of determining whether you should be you know, avoiding a certain area on a lake, for example. That's a good practical example as well. It's another example. We say black ice, the glatt ice of Deutsch, yeah? But we say black ice. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's interesting. Thanks, Ursula. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, I, w I have two observations to make. Uh, first is, uh, I think many of the color terminology came from colors of dyes. And very often, these dyes change color throughout history. And there is one example I can think of, a very specific example. The, the color sinople is not really used in, in modern English anymore. But it used to mean uh, red. It was a dye that was invented in Byzantine. It used to mean like a blood red color. But somehow it eventually uh, evolved in English into green. And this has, it's actually a physical process that, you know, because people continue to, continue to use this dye as a reference color for this, this shade. So the, the color, the term actually flipped meaning to something that, to its opposite. But this, uh, I think this process of, um, you mentioned kind of words being used figuratively and then applied to things that doesn't really is actually representative of the of the physical color. It's uh, I think this is a whole uh, the colors cut that can be used this way. For example, red can be used in many figurative ways. This is a hallmark of uh, what you call a primary color. Uh, some you know because you can't say okay this looks familiar. No, I mean even if people understand the color, but it's just uh, the, the 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 color words that cannot be used figuratively and they remain exclusively color word. So just some observations. Thank you. Anything else? Andrea, you're just passing the mic, thanks. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have another observation about um, the uh, idioms. Some of them, uh, like the red thread, come from my th mythology. So uh, the red thread is actually from uh, Greek m mythology where uh, Arachne, I don't know what she's called in English, but that's the original name, at least, where she uh, used the red thread to find her way out of a lab labyrinth. So um, many of those come from myth mythology and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question about the literature you mentioned. Uh, I just wonder where it's supposed to lead us to, because I think it's really interesting when you mentioned how, how, for example, the paper by Berlin and Sky was it Berlin and K. K. Yes. Um, and then you mentioned something about the possibility of universalism, how colors are actually perhaps related to our phys physiology, and then you sort of mentioned the other side and what's actually sort of at stake what's what does this debate lead to um i'm ju just not entirely sure um why this debate was um i assume quite um momentous maybe yes i think that well i'm not an Thank expert you. on that debate that's a good point i think the core question was to what extent um uh, i mean it feeds into just to several things to what extent the world outside 
uh, our perception depends on our language or to what extent it's rooted in uh, a, a sort of human universal to do with human human nature physically. I think that I think that's the key debate, and whether then language t in turn goes on to shape how we perceive the world, that's another debate. They've done lots of experiments with sort of Russians flashing different colors of blue and seeing whether Russians can identify them more quickly uh, than other groups and that sort of thing. So it feeds into the idea of whether uh, language is describing the world out there in sort of a more physical sense or whether we're actually what we perceive is shaped by our language. I think that's the bigger debate underlying that. Thank you. Okay, maybe one more if there is, but then we should wind up, I think, to let people get in. Yes. At the back, you were. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to add something from a Serbian perspective because we also have uh, a word for, uh, you know, when someone is blonde. Uh, we literally translate it to blue, blue hair. Plavusha is a blonde girl. And we have also uh, a phrase for black eye. It's when someone punches you and you have a bruise around your yes, eye. Yes, yes. So that's, that's just what I wanted to and, add. And you say black, you use black. You, black. You, we blue. use it uh, something between uh, black and red, mm -hmm. but it's sometimes they use just black. Yes, good. Okay, right, we better finish there. I'll put this up on the door and please do share if you have any ideas later on. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers.